Welcome back everyone to another Downward Day. And today on the channel we're actually going to be trying something a little bit different. So over the years I've done a lot of complaining on the Downward Diary. It's kind of something I've been known for doing. But you know what, this is still a new channel and I've been around this block before and this time we're going to do things a little different. Because over my many years of experience in making videos about random topics on the internet, one thing I've learned is that it's easy to point out what's wrong with something, but it takes a little bit more skill to point out where something went right. Today we're introducing a new series that I'm calling Emp Recommends, where I talk about things, particularly movies and TV, but it could be other things, that I find to be exceptional. And so hopefully throughout this series, however long it lasts, I'm going to be able to share with you guys several pieces of art and media that have profoundly altered the way that I think about creative works. We're going to be exploring things that have left a significant impact on me and how I approach working on what I create. And I understand that much of the audience for this channel is here to sort of listen to the backstory, listen to what's going on behind the scenes of how I work and what really influences my style and my direction. So with this series, if you're curious about that kind of stuff, I can point some of you guys in the right direction of just what kinds of media really resonate with me and influence and inspire my style. So with all that out of the way, Let's get into the first episode. And today we're going to be talking about one of the greatest action films of the 21st century so far, Mad Max Fury Road. So to start off, the background of this film is actually quite interesting because based on what it took to actually make it, there's really no reason why this film came out as good as it actually did. In fact, the general idea of this film was actually conceived all the way back in 1987 only for the project to go through roughly 25 years of development hell, just never really being able to get off the ground. And over the course of decades, the Mad Max franchise basically gets pushed further and further into the rearview mirror, where by the time this actually came out in 2015, most people and most regular moviegoers didn't really know that much about the Mad Max franchise, so it was almost as if these characters and the world was starting from scratch. The production of this film was delayed so long that the original protagonist of Mad Max, the actor Mel Gibson, ended up becoming too old and a little too insane and a little bit too much on a downward spiral to actually be cast as the star of this film. So in many ways, this film really comes off more as a franchise reboot than an actual sequel to the original series. But to tell you the truth, it's probably better that this film took so long. Because in the nearly 30 years that it took to actually get this project off the ground, the technology of filmmaking improved to the point where I feel like this project actually got to be executed in a way that truly fulfilled its potential. Because it's hard to imagine this movie without the incredible editing and cinematography and camera work, which I imagine only really technically became possible right around the time the film actually went into production. And I feel like had the film been made when the idea was actually conceived, the final product would not have turned out nearly as impressive. So I watched this film in theaters when it first came out in 2015, about nine years ago to the day, exactly almost. And I remember feeling at the time, walking out of the theater, that this was truly one of the first great pieces of cinema that I actually got to see in person on the big screen. And I honestly attribute this film as one of the instrumental pieces in sending me off on the search for Kino, as many on the internet would say. Before I saw this movie, I didn't really have an eye for cinema. I didn't really think too critically about what actually makes a good movie and the design aspects and the eye for detail that have to go into making a truly immersive experience. But when I saw Mad Max Fury Road in theaters for the first time, that was the first film to me that really stuck out as a cut above the rest. Where even though I didn't really have the knowledge and I couldn't go in and technically explain why it left such a powerful impression and, and why it was such a memorable experience, something about it definitely intuitively rubbed off on me. 
And it really left this impression on me of, wow, I've seen a lot of movies in theaters, but this one was something that was truly special. This was a movie for me that you don't just forget about immediately an hour after leaving the theater. This is a movie that sticks with you for days and days and you just keep thinking about it. It's one of those movies you don't even have to be reminded about it. Just the striking visuals and the unique action sequences and set pieces and character designs in this movie just, it keeps popping in your head. And I guess as we continue the rest of this series and go into the rest of the recommendations, this is going to be a common thing. And, and it's something I still can't really explain mechanically, but to me, this is a strong indicator of whenever I've experienced a piece of art that is truly impactful to me. They end up immersing you to a point where you just keep thinking about them. And Fury Road, to this day, is something I still think about a lot. And even in the last main channel video I uploaded about tornadoes, you can see it. I used clips from the movie because there are just so many scenes and sequences in this movie that just have this universal appeal to fun and adventure and chaos. So I could go on and on for a while about what exactly this movie has that makes it so good. But I'm actually going to start off here by talking about what the movie doesn't have, which in my mind is actually far more interesting to talk about. So first and foremost, this movie has very minimal dialogue. I think that the whole transcript of what characters actually say in this movie can be fit on maybe 10 pages. This is a movie that does not rely on clunky and heavy and overabundant dialogue to deliver the story. And this is something that was very distinct for the time. I mean, at the time this movie came out in 2015, you look at all the other action movies and action franchises that came out around it, Avengers, Star Wars, Batman vs. Superman, the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, pretty much all of these movies are very heavy with dialogue, and particularly expositional dialogue. And look, I'm not particularly opposed to well-written and clever dialogue, but I think there came a point in the 2010s that a lot of action directors and action franchises started to rely a little too heavily on dialogue to the point where it's almost cluttered it's clogging up the entire soundscape of the film and this is particularly prevalent in nolan's films specifically stuff like the dark knight rises and inception that type of style where there's constantly someone speaking and i'm not trying to pick on nolan here but I'm sort of just offering him up as this stylistic foil for what George Miller ended up accomplishing with Fury Road. We're pretty much, for the most part, when a character speaks in this movie, they say exactly what needs to be said for clarification of the plot or character intentions, whatever they're doing, wherever they're going next, and what needs to be done. The dialogue in this movie is bare bones, streamlined, and extremely sufficient and practical for the purpose it needs to serve. And this, in my opinion, is a tremendous strength for the film. Because since so much of the soundscape of this movie is not taken up by some character blathering on about some stupid, unnecessary, irrelevant thing that doesn't matter, it really makes the movie more atmospheric. It lets you soak in the sight and the sounds of the place, the unique environment that these characters are in. Rather than just constantly having to listen to someone explain a thing, which I feel is a bit overdone in other action movies from around the same time. And that leads me into my next point about another strength this movie has by something that it lacks. And one of the main reasons that the characters have the freedom to speak so minimally is that there is very little exposition in this movie. And that's mainly due to the fact that the plot of this film is so strikingly simple. And I feel like when it comes to contemporary film viewers, a lot of people are a little hesitant to enjoy a simple plot. A plot that just doesn't have a million bells and whistles going off and like a million machines and convoluted threads and plot twists spinning in the background. I think a lot of people these days hesitate to admit that simple plots are still extremely effective when executed well. And I think that a lot of aspiring creators, aspiring filmmakers, aspiring film buffs or whatever, when learning about filmmaking or storytelling, they get this wrong impression somewhere along the line. 
that in order for something to be good, it has to have this extremely smart and sophisticated and complex story. Where there has to be a dozen different complex, deep characters, each doing a super secret and elegantly designed thing in the story. And while that type of design can create very good and rewarding universes to engage in and explore with super epic, giant, grandiose world building, not every film has to be like that. And a film certainly doesn't need a super giant complex universe to be good and to be effective and to make a strong impression on the audience. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that making something super complex and detailed really does not work in cinema most of the time. Complex and detailed worlds are far better off in novels and giant super long book series and television where you have enough time to fully flesh out the story and the characters to actually make it a satisfying lived in world if that's the angle you're going for. But in terms of cinema, where you're trying to sell me a complete story in two hours or less. Oftentimes I find that the simple, more streamlined story can usually get the job done better. The more complex and convoluted stuff that you jam into the movie's plot, the more you have to rush through it. Because eventually the movie's gonna have to end, and you're probably gonna have to wrap it all up in a 90 to 120 minute benchmark. So eventually, if you jam too much crap in the movie, you're going to get to the point where you have to rush through it and it's, it's just not going to be able to settle in and make a strong, immersive impression on the audience. You're going to have to scramble and rush through it all just to fit it within the time limit. And again, to pick on Christopher Nolan, I'm sorry. The Dark Knight Rises is an example of a movie where he just jams in too much junk. And the movie is already like over two and a half hours long, I think. And... Even then, it, f it feels like you don't really get to soak anything in. Everything just happens one after the other immediately. Oh my god, chaos, bane, oh my god, a bunch of different things are happening. Like weeks at a time are passing within minutes in the film. And, and it's just hard to get into it because the plot is so complex and so many things are going on. The sense of immersion is compromised because everything is unfolding and unraveling so quickly, you, you don't really get this sense of place, this sense of atmosphere. And it's somewhat ironic that I make this complaint about movies and action movies in particular rushing and rushing through the plot because almost the entire plot of Mad Max Fury Road is literally about characters rushing and, and trying to escape and run away in basically what is a giant extended chase sequence that makes up the entire movie. But what's interesting to note here, and to draw another distinction with other action movies, while the tone of the movie is very frantic and the characters are often physically rushing from scene to scene, the actual scenes and the pacing themselves kind of dwell a while on each little set piece and sequence in the film. The actual individual chase sequences go on for like 10 minutes each, and it really lets you soak in what is happening. It gives you a far broader perspective of this epic chase sequence that's unfolding because you get to stick with it for a while and you get to see all the little dimensions and character and vehicle designs and all the little special individual choreographed moments that happen. It truly lets you indulge in these remarkably chaotic and frenetic sequences that you're eavesdropping on as a viewer. And so yes, while the tone of the movie is frantic and stressful and it feels like it's really rushing and the editing is really quick, plot-wise, the film actually gets to do the opposite. It gets to take its time and indulge in these truly epic sequences which are the centerpiece of the film. And it has the liberty to do that because the plot is so simple. Because they don't have to fit in a bunch of convoluted twists and turns and a million other characters and other plot devices. They don't have to waste a bunch of time and resources and direction of making the plot make sense because it's simple. And it's very obvious and clear immediately what the characters want, what their motivations are, and what they're trying to do. George Miller, when coming up with this, basically must have said, hey, let's just take these characters and have them chase each other out to the middle of the desert and then go back. And that's pretty much it. And it's not dumb, it, it doesn't reflect poorly on you to enjoy a simple movie. That's really what I'm trying to convey here with this long-winded thing. Making the plot so simple is in and of itself a smart design choice for this movie in particular, and it plays to the strength of the movie, which are the amazing and beautiful action sequences. 
So, to the uninitiated, when you say that a film has limited plot, limited exposition, and limited dialogue, many may be quick to write those off as shortcomings. However, as we see in the case of Fury Road, not only can those aspects be overcome, but they can actually result in a product that is better off and stronger than what it would have been if all those things had been more robustly included. And how George Miller manages to overcome these things is through immaculate visual storytelling. So there's this often repeated adage about interpersonal communication that stipulates that 70% of the actual information being communicated is nonverbal. Now, I don't really know the specific science behind this, but this movie is a pretty good example of how effective nonverbal communication can be. And it is a great testament to skill in filmmaking, where you can understand what the characters are feeling and what they want without any of them having to say a single word. And of course, the example in this movie, which illustrates my point, is the scene where Max is trying to bargain with Furiosa to try to get some water. And his lips are too dry and his throat's too dry and he literally cannot speak. So he has to do this entire scene, basically, where he's negotiating with Furiosa without being able to speak a single word. But the direction and acting, it, it comes off seamless. You, you understand exactly what is happening without any dialogue having to be exchanged. And this, to me, is the essence of great filmmaking. Obviously, this scene is an example, but the entire movie is full of scenes like this where... Characters don't have to say anything because through skilled direction and cinematography, nonverbal cues are often sufficient to convey exactly what needs to be conveyed to the audience. And again, this feature is incredibly useful for saving time in the movie and allowing the movie to breathe and the audience to soak in the atmosphere of this incredible world that George Miller has constructed. And as is the case with unspoken character interaction, the lore and world building of the Mad Max post-apocalyptic universe manages to be sufficiently presented without having to dump a bunch of clunky exposition on the audience and disrupt the pacing. There is tremendous attention to detail in this film on the world that the characters live in. The costume and makeup designs in this movie are all top-notch. They breathe incredible life and distinction into all these sorts of different scattered factions across the desert. Simply by looking at how they're dressed, what their physical appearance tends to be, and what kind of vehicles they use, you can pretty easily pick up on details about what they do in their day-to-day -day lives and, and what their life is like in the desert, all without anyone having to explain who anyone is or what they do. The aesthetic presentation of the characters in the movie is truly on point at visually conveying exactly what their lives are like. And what results is a world that feels truly cohesive. And more specifically, it's a world that feels truly exotic. It obviously has a few elements from contemporary society that we live in. However, the way the characters act and the tribalism and strange, eccentric, primitive reversion of behavior, it truly feels like that we, the audience, are engaging in a world that is completely unlike our own. And the whole thing just comes off as a very plausible presentation of the path society could go on long term if it did break down into this post-apocalyptic anarchy. So in this movie, what you're not going to see is a bunch of stupid millennial one-liners designed to get a cheap laugh out of the audience that completely breaks the immersion and world building. This movie manages to convey its own consistent set of social cues and standards that is completely removed from our own. And it helps make all the world building so much more believable. It's just such a unique and refreshing experience compared to most of the other action films that came out at around the same time. Even the physical desert setting feels unique. And I know what you're thinking, well, how different could a desert look from any other desert? Well, it turns out in this movie, they went out to Namibia, which I'm not sure if any other major blockbuster has been filmed there, but you can subtly tell that it, it looks different and distinct from just the typical California desert where most blockbusters are filmed. 
And I'm sure that this decision was made at incredible expense to the budget because it's not exactly easy to ship a bunch of film equipment out to some place in South Africa compared to just doing it in California next to where all the studios are located. However, like with many other design decisions in this movie, the extra effort pays off into making something that feels special, that doesn't look like anything else, that doesn't sound like anything else. And I guess that's possibly my biggest takeaway with why I enjoy this movie so much and why it's considered one of the greats in all of action. There is pretty much nothing else that compares to the experience of this movie. And even now, re-watching it almost a decade later, it's still one of the best looking movies in existence. And this point has already been talked about to death on YouTube, but the film's insistence on using practical effects for most of the visual composition is truly worthy of its praise. So the extensive use of practical effects is something you don't really see in big budget movies anymore. It sort of harkens back to an older, more elegant time in cinema, where the only means of pulling off truly epic, grandiose shots of scale was to actually put a scene together for real. Like if you wanted a scene with a massive battleground, you would have to physically construct the entire landscape and fill it with hundreds and hundreds of real extras. Obviously, in modern times, computers have made most of that work redundant and they can do it far faster and for cheaper than what used to have to be done to make those kinds of scenes. So yes, it is a real treat to turn on Mad Max Fury Road and see these giant wide-angle landscape views featuring a convoy of dozens of custom-built vehicles and knowing that these things were actually constructed and driven in real time. When you see the soldiers of the cult do these incredible acrobatic movements in combat, it is very satisfying to learn that the film employed real Cirque du Soleil actors to perform these stunts pretty much for real. And while again, computers have gotten good at doing large-scale action sequences, I feel like they lack the grit and the precise physics of these giant battles unfolding actually for real with real actors in a real physical space. And I feel like it's really important to appreciate this detail because again, it's something you don't see anymore because of the simple ease and convenience of using computers in high-budget films. But of course, that's not to say that this film is entirely without computer graphics. There's plenty of CG constructions throughout the movie. But again, as is the case with the visual composition of the project at large, the limited uses of CG in this movie do look quite fantastic. I think the most iconic centerpiece of which is the massive dust storm with a bunch of dust tornadoes picking up and sucking up and disrupting the convoy. Those effects still look really good today even with the most modern computerized things coming out in movies. And I think the limited but strong use of computer graphics in this movie speak to another advantage that it was able to create over other movies of the same genre. Where nowadays it's very common, especially from major studios, for the studios to offload pretty much massive massive workloads on visual effects artists. And especially in recent years, there's been a lot of bad press within the film industry of VFX artists being overworked and underpaid and basically being responsible in a huge time crunch for creating almost everything you see on screen. And I feel like this super heavy workload culture, which has become common in Hollywood for major motion pictures, it sort of devalues the magic that computer graphics are really capable of creating. When the VFX department is so heavily dependent on, where they have to texture everything and animate all of the individual physics and do all of the lighting, it simply won't leave them with enough time to create a work of craftsmanship, something that, that is truly special and polished. The work instead is ubiquitous, and you don't really get to see what kind of specific special advantages that computer graphics can provide to a movie. And again, I believe this to be a major strength of Mad Max Fury Road and why the entire visual composition looks so good. Most of the work of creating the visuals, the lighting and the physics of things moving around in real time, that was already done once the film was already shot. So it really allowed the CG artists on this movie to truly hone in on their craft, the specific shots where CG elements were required they actually had a decent amount of time to focus on each 
composition that they were working on and make it more polished and more special looking. And I think this film is a great example of striking a balance between real life practical imagery and computer graphics, which are used primarily to assist the overall composition and not relied on as a huge, tremendous crutch to unload the entire visual workload of the project as a whole. It seems that there's definitely a sweet spot between practical and CG where you can make something that looks truly great. And I can still say with confidence that watching this movie in 2024 was just as much of a treat as watching it when it first came out in theaters. Just because of how much it still stands out as a unique experience compared to the rest of the genre. Nowadays this film still carries a pretty big cult following. And it's not uncommon to see clips from this movie still pretty frequently shared on social media and memes and other things like that. What's strange is that it feels like this movie had a pretty big cultural impact, but when you look at the box office numbers, they're really not that impressive. In fact, the industry consensus seems to indicate that this movie actually lost money. The budget was pretty high in and of itself, and not enough people went to see it. And part of that can be explained from the fierce competition it faced from other action-adventure movies in 2015. I mean, looking at the list here, you had Star Wars, Jurassic World, Fast and Furious 7, Avengers Age of Ultron, Spectre, Mission Impossible, Hunger Games. 2015 was just this stacked year in terms of action movies, so unfortunately, Mad Max Fury Road appeared to go under the radar for a lot of people, and I don't think a lot of people really saw it while it was out in theaters, which is a shame, because I feel like a movie this fresh deserved to be renowned at least a little more for what it managed to accomplish. But unfortunately, it came out at the peak of Star Wars mania, Avengers mania, and, and people were sort of looking for different things out of action movies. The pure action experience didn't exactly seem to be that high on people's desires at that time. It seemed like people were way more content about superheroes and zany Marvel writing back then. And Mad Max, while it didn't do awful, kind of got pushed to the wayside by a lot of the mainstream movie-going audience. And maybe if it did a little bit better, we wouldn't have had to wait almost a decade for the sequel. It seems like today, at least, that the movie-going audience has gotten pretty fatigued of the classic Marvel superhero formula, the Star Wars hero formula, and they may be a bit more perceptive today to the Mad Max style. So hopefully, the Furiosa movie ends up being as good, but I don't know. George Miller is getting up there in age, and it's going to be a tall order for him to capture lightning in a bottle for the second time in a row. But hopefully the Furiosa movie ends up being a worthy successor. And the modern Mad Max franchise finally gets the respect it deserves. But hey, even if it ends up being a disappointment for whatever reason, it shouldn't take away from the excellence of Fury Road. And at the very least, I can hope that Furiosa puts more eyeballs on the original and more people can appreciate one of the best action films to come out in the last 25 years.